welcome to another episode of Image Rights by N. Machinini, the only podcast dedicated to image rights in Africa and around the globe. This season, we are starting off with the BRICS nations, in other words, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and of course, South Africa. And we look at how each of these nations protect and advance image rights in the context of specifically sports players, but also ordinary persons and celebrities. And starting this season, I am honored to have with me Gabriel Iguina. Gabriel is a Brazilian multilingual sports player, I mean, sports lawyer (laughs) from Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And he graduated in law in 2019 and with a master's degree in international sports law at ISDE Madrid. He is also a junior associate at the prestigious Portuguese sports law boutique, 14 Sports Law, based in Porto, Portugal. Gabriel provides legal advice to clients such as clubs, players, and agents regarding contractual matters relating to employment, transfer, representation, and of course, image rights contracts. While he also represents his client's interests before international sports tribunals, such as the FIFA Football Tribunal, and the Court of Arbitration of Sports, also known as CAS, based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Currently, Gabriel is based in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and he also supports 14 sports laws clients in the South American business, as well as being the contact point for local clients. Welcome to the show, Gabriel. Uh, Thanks a lot, Dr. Machinini, for the invitation. For me, it's a pleasure to be here. I think that your project is quite interesting, uh, especially nowadays that with the advance of technology, I think that image rights has become one of the most interesting and the most relevant topics around the world. So congratulations for the project as well. Well, um, I'm really honored to have you here today, Gabriel, to speak about Brazil because I think Brazil is a very special one, which is why it's kickstarting this season. Uh, given the rich history of image rights protection and also the rich history of sports players coming from Brazil, more specifically in the context of football players. Um, So the first thing I wanted to ask you, though, is if you could maybe give us a brief contextualization of the regulation of image rights in Brazil. Um, Are image rights actually concretely recognized, firstly? And what does the regulatory framework look like in Brazil? So yes, the the image rights, they are widely recognized by the Brazilian law. And actually, uh, as I believe in most parts of the world, the image rights in Brazil, they are recognized as a personality right, uh, as a personality right. So uh, in summary, those personality rights, they have a few uh, characteristics that are very important and which define them perfectly, which is basically they are all absolute untransmissible, indefeasible, one waveable and perpetual. And those characteristics, they are very relevant for the protection of image rights in Brazil because uh, the image rights, they are uh, widely and very intrinsically connected with the rights, right of privacy and the right of intimacy. And the Brazilian legislation actually protects very well the image rights. Uh, The image rights, they are foreseen in the Brazilian constitution uh, as a fundamental right, which is one of the most important rights uh, and and the most protected rights under the Brazilian law. And also the image rights, they are foreseen in the Brazilian civil code, under which anyone who has uh, their image violated can first request to remove any post or any publication with their image that they feel that violates their image rights and their privacy, their honor, their good fame. And secondly, they can ask for compensation for such breach. Of course, that those cases, they will be analyzed on a case by case basis because sometimes the claims, they don't have enough reasoning to be accepted by a judge or or by a decision body. But basically, the Brazilian, uh, the the image rights under the Brazilian law, they are very well protected, and they have some particular characteristics that protect them, uh, basically, uh, in a in a very in a very broad way. So, uh, yes, they are very well protected. 
that's a very advanced approach because in most jurisdictions um you find a common law approach to to protecting image rights whereas brazil yes. has actually legislated on this but I, I i understand that this is something that was potentially a big need already um especially for sports players in in brazil which brings me to my next uh, point if you could please lay out the intersection between image rights and sports law specifically um but also talk a bit about how you know the, the kind of gaming content that depicts sports players uh, has been addressed in this image rights regulatory framework in brazil mm -hmm. so uh in Brazil, uh, sports law and image rights, they are very well connected because, of course, as you already said, uh, here the biggest stars are the football players and Brazil is, is, is very connected with football. We have one of the most passionate fans, football fans around the world, so we consume football a lot and, of course, that the, the protagonists of football are the football players themselves. So basically uh if if i can summarize the intersection between uh sports law image rights and gaming content in brazil i think the most emblematic case is the one uh of ea sports which is a gaming producer that produces uh the fifa game the football game and basically brazil of course is one of the biggest markets for for the fifa game because as we consume football a lot, of course, that we want to play with the teams we love. We want to play to control the players that we love. So basically, uh, for the past six or six, seven years, there are no Brazilian players which play in Brazilian football clubs licensed in the EA Sports game FIFA. And the reasoning behind uh, this absence of the Brazilian football players is the very specific protection of the image rights under the Brazilian law. So what happens under the Brazilian law? Uh, basically, uh, anyone is entitled to grant authorizations for someone for a company or even, even a single person to explore their image. But there, there are some, some specific criteria to be met for this contract of image rights to be valid. First and foremost, it must have an express, an express individual and personal authorization for someone to explore their image. This is very important under this case because the personal authorization is necessary. Uh, the scope of, of the exploring of someone's image, it must be limited and interpreted in a restrictive way. So if I grant you, uh, if we sign an image rights contract and I grant you authorization to, to explore only my likeness, but not my voice. So you are only entitled to explore my likeness and not my voice. If you use my voice, you are already breaching my image rights under the Brazilian law. So basically what happened uh, in this case was that in the past editions of FIFA, we had the Brazilian players uh, which played in Brazilian clubs uh, in the EA Sports uh, FIFA game. But what happened is that some players started to realize that they did not have an image rights contract signed directly with EA Sports, but maybe only with their club or not even with their club sometimes. And what EA Sports does basically around the world is that they sign an agreement with FIFPRO, which, which can be summarized as the International Players Union. And FIFPRO grants uh, EA Sports the rights to explore the image of a lot of players around the world, but because FIFPRO in some countries have contracts with the leagues or with the clubs themselves. So this is the way that EA Sports relied on, on, on those contracts to explore the image of football players. But in Brazil, when when the players started realizing uh, the particularities of the protection of image rights in Brazil, and they understood that they did not have granted EA Sports directly and personally the authorization to explore their image, 
they started file, filing claims uh, within the Brazilian dispute resolution bodies and the Brazilian courts. And actually, uh, the Brazilian courts, they decided in multiple cases, multiple, we have a wide, a wide example of, of cases in which the players, they won the dispute and they were entitled to receive compensation. And when we are talking here about uh, 300 players, maybe per, per game, per, <laughs> per, per title. So this is a lot of money in the end of the day. Yeah. And this created a lot of trouble for your sports. So they basically, for the past six or seven editions, actually, they, they just launched their new edition, which is FIFA 23 last week. And we don't have any Brazilian players in the game, not the Brazilian players that play in Brazilian clubs, at least. So this is, of course, uh, an emblematic case. And I think it can summarize how the image rights are protected in Brazil and how specific this protection is. Wow. Um... I'm understanding that because, as you said earlier, um, image rights are categorized as personality rights. Um, yes. This is why there is such a strong emphasis on that direct consent from the, the, the image rights holder, basically. That um, there isn't um, sort of like an agent or an association that can sign away someone's image rights without them granting that direct permission. Um, because it, it's not, image rights are not seen as, as property, but seen as a, a part of a person's personality here. So what I'm wondering, though, is with EA deciding to not have any Brazilian um, sports players in FIFA, who, who's really losing for the past six, seven years? Is it EA or is it the players? Because from my perspective, I'm looking at and I'm thinking, the FIFA games still sell, which is why they're still producing them. But then again, what's FIFA without Brazilian players? <laughs> <laughs> so who's really losing here? Yeah, so I think it's important for us just to clarify that we have Brazilian players in the game, but all the Brazilian players that we have are playing abroad. They play yeah. for European clubs or they play outside Brazil. So we don't have the Brazilian players that play in Brazilian clubs. Oh, okay. And because when, when the players, they go abroad and when, for example, Neymar signs with PSG, they have a different jurisdiction. Maybe the contract between those players and their clubs are more complete and the clubs, in some ways, they can be entitled to grant their rights, uh, uh, to grant the players' rights to companies to explore the image. For example, of course, that sponsors can can always the sponsors of the clubs can always explore the players image of course that we, we must have a very complete contract but basically uh i believe honestly that uh the players in this case they lose more than than ea sports because ea sports uh, they they make a lot of money with the game every year uh the, their revenue is not is not heavily impacted by this issue and i think that as the dimension the international dimension of the game is 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 so big that the players are losing an opportunity to to be known by the world because sometimes uh, a brazilian player that plays in a brazilian club he can be very well known in brazil but maybe in most parts of the world nobody knows uh, who he is, at least um, not until he reaches uh, a technical point where uh, European clubs are starting to look at him and, and the, he is making some noise. So I, I believe that the players, they try to go after a little bit of compensation under, under those lawsuits. But in the end of the day, uh, I think in most of the cases, uh, they lose the opportunity to be seen and, and to be played with uh, around most parts of the world. And I think this is an important part of their image and how to, and how to explore their image correctly. But of course mm -hmm. that sometimes, for example, if a player is already retired, as the image rights, they are unprescribable. They, they can also sue, for example, EA Sports after they retire because they won't be in the game anymore, but they were in the game, for example, six years ago. So they can go after EA Sports and claim for compensation once they are retired, for example. 
So it is a quite it is a quite interesting issue. But in the end of the day, I think the players are losing more than EA Sports in this case. Yeah, yeah, which is why EA could forego the uh, opportunity to use the images in these games. So you know, exactly. speaking of images, um, it's interesting how the world has developed in terms of artificial intelligence systems and with machine learning and deep learning. And I wanted to pick your brain about how the, the influence of artificial intelligence is affecting the Brazilian regulatory approach to image rights. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about that? Because a lot of the times I see um, you know, people creating deep fakes using other people's images, especially celebrity images without permission. Um, I'm seeing a lot of um, AI created artistic works I'm also seeing a lot of videos where people are sort of creating these um, tattoos or designer haircuts um, that have people's images on them, especially sports players' images on them. So how how does this these technological developments influence or impact the image rights protection in Brazil? So I think I think uh, those those new kind of technologies, of course, that they impact the image rights protection in Brazil because I think mostly deepfakes they are they are very reliable and sometimes you you really can't identify if the video is true or not. For example, here just yesterday we had the Brazilian elections and we know that sometimes this can be created even to influence the, and, and to impact the Brazilian or, or any anywhere in the world, the elections, because uh, the content is so reliable. And I believe that today, nowadays, we don't have the proper care to try to, to go after the truth. Uh, I yeah. think that we, we only see one source of information and then we don't do the proper fact checking to understand if whether, for example, a certain video, video is true or, or if it's or if it is fake. So I think it represents a challenge because we know that the bureaucracy behind uh, the change of laws uh, is very uh, it's, it's very time consuming. And we know that it is very hard to keep pace with the technology when we are talking about regulations. So uh, in some specific cases, uh, it is very hard, for example, in the deepfake cases, and I believe that the jurisprudence in this case, it plays a very relevant role because um, as the, the scope of protection of image rights in Brazil is very broad, the judges, they, they have a certain margin to interpret each case and to use the current Brazilian law to try to protect someone's image rights quite easily, okay? So uh, in order, Basically, in order for, for an image rights to be breached under the Brazilian law, uh, we have three or four most common ways of breaches, which is the breach when someone feels that they had their honor breached by the unauthorized use of the image, mm -hmm. or if they had their privacy breached, or of course, if they had some kind of defamation, uh, which I can, which I believe it's the most uh the most uh, common issues with, for example, with deepfakes. And the, the last case, it is when someone explores someone's image for commercial means without an appropriate authorization. So with that, I believe that the judges, they can decide and, and they can identify if the image rights were breached. But uh, specifically talking about the law, it is very challenging because of the bureaucracy behind uh, the changing and the passing of new laws. But yeah. here we are talking about deepfakes, baby arts. But when we are talking about, for example, tattoos and someone doing a haircut with a football player, uh, with the image of a football player, I think this is very hard to be considered a breach of the image rights under the Brazilian law. Because as I said before, uh, it is very unlikely first that this person who might have their image rights breached sees this picture or this tattoo. Yeah. I think sometimes it's very hard. So mm -hmm. as, as it is a personality right, uh, only, the, only the holder of this right 
is entitled to file a claim against someone who might have breached their image rights. And I think it's very unlikely that a judge honestly would, would decide that this tattoo or this haircut uh, uh, somehow breached someone's honor or someone's privacy uh, in a way that uh, caused any kind of any kind of uncomfort for them. So there are some examples which are very hard, and especially talking about technology. But this kind of issues about the tattoos and maybe the haircuts, I believe it's very hard uh, for us to, to define a breach of the image rights under the Brazilian law. It's interesting because um, I'm thinking about, for instance, the, the barber who does the haircut or the tattoo artist who, who you know, gets paid to <laughs> make this image um, in the form of a tattoo. Um, wouldn't that constitute some form of commercial exploitation of someone's image in some form or way? Um, it, it's, it's quite challenging, especially when you have social media where people then upload images of these tattoos as well as their, you know, their haircuts on, on social media. It's, it's as if there's this ongoing exploitation. And even though we may not be able to necessarily pinpoint who's, who's potentially violating the image rights. Um, I think there, there's something to be said about the extent of the use of someone's image without their permission in such contexts. Um, because at the end of the day, the barber, the tattoo artist, they probably get more business when people see the kind of work that they can produce um, using these, these images. Because I think if if I have a, a favorite sports player whom I see someone has a very um, unique and quite clear tattoo done, I'd probably ask them, where did you get this done? <laughs> and maybe bring more business for the tattoo artist, you know? So those are the things that, I'm, that made me wonder um, about this kind of rigid regulation that you have in Brazil of image rights. So, yeah, but I do understand what you say that the first hurdle here is someone needs to pick up that my image was used in a, in a tattoo or a haircut or a deep fake, for instance, before it can trigger any sort of um, remedy in any case. So that there has to be some form of injury. Um, but it's quite interesting um, what you mentioned here. But the other thing that I, I found interesting, which is a follow up on on this sort of these unique kinds of exploitations is the question of taxation. Because in many jurisdictions, when particularly sports players, when they commercially exploit their image rights, they tend to uh, attract tax liability for such income. Um, but of course, the, the barber who does the haircut doesn't attract any tax liability for that, nor does the tattoo artist and probably not the deep fake uh, creator as well. But tell us about how taxes are, are treated specifically in the context of image rights in, in Brazil in a general sense. That I believe that you are 100% right, for example, when you say that a tattooer or, or a barber maybe reproduces someone's image uh, in, in some form of uh, financial exploitation. And this might be considered, of course, a breach of the image rights. Uh, but as I said that, I think it's very hard that someone is going to go until the end and file a claim just to ask compensation for that because they would, it, it, it would be a lot of work maybe for not a lot of money in the end of the day. So yes. uh, in practical reasons, I believe it's hard, but under the Brazilian law is 100% possible, of course. Uh, but about, about the taxation of image rights in Brazil, it is quite interesting because uh, here we have basically a general sports law under which uh, the clubs and the employers they are entitled to divide the athlete's remuneration between an employment contract and an image rights contract. This is foreseen in the specific sports law of Brazil. Uh, 
Basically, a club can divide and can pay up to 40% of the athlete's remuneration under an image rights contract. But to understand the context behind uh, this law, I think it's, it's important for us to go back a bit in the past to understand why this, the, the, the regulations are the way it is right now. Uh, so basically, in the past, what happened is, uh, of course, that any employer in Brazil, they have to pay social, uh, social, social security contribution for each, employer, for each employee they have. And basically, under an employment contract, if you pay remuneration and if you employ someone, you have to pay social uh, security contribution. And this represents sometimes it can be quite onerous for the employers. So uh, when you have a football player, when you, when you have here very well remunerated football players, when you pay a lot of money under an employment contract, your, your, social, uh, so your social security contribution will get higher as well. So in a way, in an attempt to circumvent the Brazilian labor law, what clubs and of course that the players contributed to, the, to this as well, uh, they proposed was to divide the players or the athletes remuneration between an image rights contract, which is a civil contract and not a labor contract. So under the civil contract, you don't have to pay social security contributions. <laughs> And this way, the clubs, they, they ended up saving a lot of money because in the past, we didn't have had this 40% limitation. So clubs could pay, for example, 80% of the player's salary under an, in, under an image rights agreement and only 20% under the labor contract. And this way, they saved a lot of money. But of course, that the legislator, they are not stupid and they, they realize what was happening. And they thought that it would be a good idea at least to regulate this because uh, the abuse of this strategy was so big that sometimes the clubs, they signed players who had no notoriety at all. They were not known by anyone. Their image was not that valuable. And they paid 80% of the players' remuneration under an image rights agreement that they didn't even use. <laughs> they didn't even explore the player's image. They just don't want it to pay the, the social security contributions. Mm. And, and this way, uh, the Brazilian law uh, changed a little bit and they regulated this at least to put a limitation on it. Uh, but this is basically the taxation on the club side. On the player side, uh, uh, the player can also take advantage of this, of this division of remuneration because what usually happens in Brazil and most parts of the world when we are talking about at least football players and sports persons is that usually to sign the image rights agreement, they create a company under their name to which they grant their image rights. And this company basically is entitled to commercialize the player's rights because the player is the owner of the company. And this way, at least in Brazil and then I believe also in most parts of the world, the taxation for companies is lower than the taxation for natural persons. So if you receive 60% of your salary under your employment agreement and 40% under your image rights agreement, which is signed between your employer and your company, you are going to pay less taxes in the end of the day uh, if, uh, if you receive 100% uh, of your remuneration under your employment agreement only, because this way your taxation will get higher at the end of the day. So I think uh, this relation is now regulated under the Brazilian law, is authorized, but also still the jurisprudence recognizes that uh, there are still abuses of this authorization of division of, of, of the remuneration. And if there is an investigation under which it can be concluded without no doubt that even if respected the 40% limit under the, the image rights agreement, even uh, so, if, there, if it is found that the, they only signed this image rights agreement in order to reduce the taxes or in order to get rid 
of the social security contributions. Uh, the judges, they usually decide that 100% of the remuneration uh, is the player's salary under the employment agreement for these purposes, because uh, sometimes the clubs still sign image rights agreements with players, but they don't use the image rights agreements. They don't explore the player's image. So, so their intention here is very clear. They just don't want to pay taxes, both the player and the club. So it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting. Wow. Um, you know, the first thing that I ever thought about, the first time I heard about image rights taxation was, is it fair to tax image rights income? Um, and I think that, that from what you've described, Okay, I'm back. You're back. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so what I what I was saying was I, I find it interesting because when from what you've described, it sounds like there's an outcry from the sports players in particular about image rights taxation. Um well I, I wouldn't really understand the outcry from the perspective of the clubs, but I do understand that there there's probably questions about why should I be taxed for exploiting my personality? Um, ha have these been some of the motivations behind the, the sports players trying to avoid this kind of tax? It might be, but in the end of the day, it's not a justification because this method that I explained, uh, it is basically used to pay the player's remuneration as a football player and not specifically about uh, their exploring of their image. Of course, that it is connected and the clubs, they use those kind of contracts to explore the players' images. Uh, not all of the cases, it is a fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's quite an interesting discussion because, as you said, it is a personality right. Uh, but the, the specific characteristic of the image rights, which is that there is the possibility of, uh, of commercializing those rights, uh, in the end of the day, it is an additional income for the players. So they are earning money, of course, that uh, under the scope of a personality right, but it is a remuneration in the end of the day. And at least in Brazil, it's quite clear that this, this kind of argument would not be enough under, under dispute uh, to try to, to not pay taxes on uh, on image rights contracts. Yeah. Um, speaking of image rights contracts, you you deal a lot with image rights contracts in your line of work. And I'm sure you've seen quite a number of pitfalls um, in these contracts and ways in which the parties to the contracts may try to um, cheat one another in some way as to the extent of exploitation and compensation for exploitation. So based on your experience, what are the, the pro tips or um, the kind of advice you would give to young and upcoming sports players who are trying to negotiate their image rights contracts um, on how they can get the best deal? What would you say to some of our audience about that? Well, I believe that specifically under the Brazilian law, I think the most important uh, thing to be aware is that, as I said before, those kind of image rights contracts, they have a few criteria in order to be valid. And the most important one here, I believe, is the wording of the scope of this contract. Uh, because as, as the scope is interpreted in a restrictive way, 
anything that is left outside the scope of the image rights agreement cannot be explored in this example by the club. So as I said before, if we sign an image rights agreement under which you can use uh, by my likeness and my voice, but you cannot use, for example, my signature to commercially exploit my signature. And you, in the end of the day, uh, you publish a picture with my signature or you made a t-shirt with my signature in it, and then you commercialize my signature. This is already a breach of my image rights. So I think for, for young for young sports person, I believe is that the, the, the best tip is to, to pay a lot of attention to the scope of the agreements that you are signing. Because you have to be aware that anything that is written in the contract, the club is authorized to use. But anything that is left outside the scope cannot be used by enemies. And if it is used, it is already a breach of your image rights. So, and a second thing uh, that I believe is very important is the is the is the term of the agreement, because as as a personality right, you cannot just grant uh, your image rights to someone for uh, an undetermined term. So you must set a limit to this contract. Any contract that does not have a term, any image contract that does not have a term will be deemed null and void under the, under the Brazilian legislation and under the Brazilian jurisprudence as well. So this is also very important. Hmm. Wow. Um, it, it's quite interesting because I've also seen people battle over what they call post-mortem image rights, um, because it's, it arises a lot in the context of famous people that when they leave their estates to their children, for instance, and such certain entities want to continue to exploit their images, a battle comes up about, well, who whose rights is it anyway, um, given that the person has passed on? Um, so thank you so much for those tips. Um, I find it quite interesting the way- Just. In I'm sorry, just, just one thing that you mentioned, and this is very important that I forgot to mention. Under the Brazilian Civil Code, it is expressly determined that the successors of someone who, who already deceased are entitled to claim compensation for any breach of the image rights of, of, of this person. So there is specifically determined under the, the, the Brazilian Civil Code, the post-mortem uh, claim for compensation on the breach of image rights. Hmm. Nice. That's something that we don't have in South Africa, uh, particularly because we regulate image rights through the common law. Um, there's no legislation at all for this. Um, but I see the benefits of actually having it codified because you can actually then create the post-mortem rights. Um, because often when someone passes away, companies find it it's like they are happy that they can now freely exploit someone's identity or image. Um, so I'm, I'm quite happy with the way in which Brazil is looking. Although it is slightly uh, rigid, I find that it gives the control of the image rights to the, the personality instead of the, the companies that oversee the personality. And that is quite unique. Um, I appreciate that about that legal system. But thank you, uh, Gabrielle, for being with us today. I'm sure that the audience uh, will get very useful and insightful information from this podcast episode. Um, and I'm sure people who didn't understand why they're not seeing some of the um, less um, famous Brazilian sports stars in the EA games will now understand why this is happening and that it's how it relates to image rights protection. And all the best with your future um, endeavors, especially in sports law and image rights related issues. It was an honor having you as my guest today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nashini. Uh, I think uh, the discussion was, was great. And I hope that I, that I can pay my share of contribution to, the, to, the, to your project, which I think is very relevant and very useful around the world. So thank you very much and congratulations for the project as well. Thank you. Remember to control your image rights.